If you are a graduate student that needs to do independent research, then you have to understand the difference between methods and methodologies. So today we are discussing what are methods and things to consider so you can pick the best methods for you. But first, what are methods? To put it simply, methods are the ways in which you collect data for your research. And because there are a variety of different types of data, there are a variety of different methods to do in research. Now with that said, of course then your data is going to impact which methods are best for you. Generally, there are two types of different methods. There are qualitative and quantitative methods. And these can vary based off of your discipline, but more importantly, they will differ between your particular research question. Quantitative data is probably the data that we are most familiar with. And generally it is data that deals with measurements, quantities, and ranges. Or in other words, it is data that is measuring something and oftentimes deals with numbers and math. Qualitative data is more about intangible information that gives you more context or more nuance to the research that you are doing. Qualitative data is more about the feelings, experiences, histories, and stories that go around your research to help your audience or to help you demonstrate more about what is going on, both in a smaller scale, but also in a larger systemic scale. Now, even between these two different types of data or within these categories, there's still a variety of different types of approaches that you can use to conduct your research and collect your data. And for that reason, methods are super important because it's all about the questions that you have and the information that is important to you. And so while one person may use one particular method for similar information, you may employ a different method to get a different type of information from a similar context. And so methods are really about you and your research. Now methods for the most part in STEM are pretty straightforward because you kind of already been practicing it, or at least if you grew up in the US educational system and you've taken a science class, you're kind of familiar with the scientific method or what that could look like. And so generally, you may have a research question like how durable is a specific polymer? And then you may want to conduct research to test how durable it is. So your methods are how you would measure the durability of your polymer. Now this could be a variety of different ways depending on what you need that polymer to do. But like an example could be that you may have a piece of plastic and you you expose it to blunt force and then you measure how much force was used or the PSI of the pressure or you measure the amount of damage that the polymer received in different contexts and that again will give you two different answers but still measure durability now again there's probably a hundred thousand different ways to do it to give you more accurate information or more useful information but that's how I would bring it up as somebody who's a non-material engineer but just bringing that to the forefront that again it's not not necessarily that there's one way to do something, but rather trying to figure out what is the information you want to get out and what is the approach or the manners or the steps to make sure you're getting that information. Now, while they're not in the STEM field, social scientists also often use quantitative data. For example, if you are a social scientist and you're interested in understanding the amount of incarcerated youth from a particular location, then your methods would definitely be counting information and that is a quantitative data set and so you may go into a specific region look up all the people that have been incarcerated before the age of 18 or by the age of 18 count them up and make sure that they're coming from a certain or a certain zip code or location but that may only give you a little bit of information to help you fuller understand what you're trying to do or why this data matters. And for that reason, this is where qualitative data comes in. So if you're a social scientist and now you've done all of the quantitative part of your research and you know about 65% of all kids or all youths in this region go or get incarcerated before they turn 18, you may be questioning, well, why? This is why qualitative data is so important because it gives you this intangible information that numbers just can't do. And so as a result, you may go and 
interview family members, go speak with the students directly, go interview or talk to cops or local community members. You may also go into the archives or look at local newspapers to see what information is surrounding these contexts of incarceration or this community or even political figures and their impacts or laws or things like that that are impacting this community. And so from there, this qualitative data or this intangible non-numerical data is now saying if 65% of the students or 65% of youth are being incarcerated in this community, here are some examples as to why or here's some nuance or context as to what is going on in that community that may make them more susceptible to incarceration. So if you are a graduate student in STEM or in social sciences, sometimes your methods just feel very intuitive. They're just how you get the information. And as a result, you're usually coming from or getting information from a specific data set, be it you know, people, communities, subjects, animals, the chemicals or the reactions that you're observing, or the list goes on. As humanity majors, we may be doing research on a song, a dance, a film, an art project. And because of that, it just may not immediately feel as intuitive, but I guarantee it is just as intuitive as STEM and as social sciences once you better understand what are the different methods within humanities and which ones are the ones you are applying or need to apply for your research. So an example of this is if you are an art historian and you are doing research on a particular painting from a specific era and you're trying to understand or trying to present its importance to a particular time or a circumstance, then you would most likely need to understand kind of the background history of the object, where it was, what it was doing, who made it, why, what does it look like? And all of those questions require a type of method and that is oftentimes visual analysis that's when you're looking at the object and depicting or dissecting what is in it what are the icons what is the iconography what does this all mean but you also probably do some sort of archival analysis or discourse analysis where you're going into the archives and you're reading more about the history or the context of the painting but then you may also be reading how people received it how it was critiqued what people thought of it how they were talking about it in the newspapers and the whatever the collectors what did they say about it and that's discussing or analyzing the conversations around it and so immediately Immediately, you may not realize that those are your methods. To look at the painting is a method. To go into the archives is a method. And to read about people's opinions and to dissect those opinions is a method. And all of those methods, visual analysis, discourse analysis, archive analysis, are very specific to humanities, but again, can be used by a variety of different people. So as you start to get into the research, you'll start to notice what are your methods within humanities as you start to understand what are your options. It's important to just reiterate that while some disciplines may use specific methods over and over and over again, methods are not necessarily discipline or department focus. Instead, they are literally about you and your research project. So it is so important that you are not just doing methods because everybody else around you is doing it, but instead you are actively searching for the best methods to give you the best information for your research. Because again, methods are just literally the information or the ways in which you get information to conduct your research. They are how you collect data. So depending on your data, your methods should change. It should not be your methods are leading your data, but instead your data or the information you need should guide you into selecting your methods. But now I bet you're probably wondering, how do you figure out what are your methods? Now, generally, pretty much there's three really simple ways to make sure you have access or you can just find what are your methods options. The first is pretty straightforward and it's getting onto Google and searching. What are qualitative methods? What are quantitative methods? And then reading about those methods, reading about the context in which those methods are used, what types of questions can those methods ask, and what are the limits to some of those questions? That can help you start to get your brain kind of going and understanding what is going on so you can see your options. 
The next thing you could do, and I always suggest this in any time you have to figure something out in your grad school process, is to talk to people. You can talk to graduate students, your faculty, your advisors, and present to them your research ideas, your topics, and ask them what type of methods do you think would be useful to answer this question, or could be useful in this particular data set. And just having an open conversation with others can again expose you to different options, the limitations, and the opportunities that exist in a variety of different methods. But before you you do either one of those, I actually would highly suggest you start off going to Sage Research Methods, which is a scholarly publication that is online that presents a ton of online resources from articles to books to videos and even podcasts that help you as a researcher or as a graduate student understand more about methods and even methodologies. Now, I know you're probably like, okay, but this video is about methods and I don't know what methodologies are, and that is fine. I'm dropping a video on methodologies very soon, so make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss that video. But Sage Research Methods is an amazing resource because it not only tells you or presents lists and lists and lists of methods that you can use, but they give you particular context, they give you case studies, they give you videos that give you how-tos, limits, and information that really can be a crash course into understanding what methods will work for you and what are the types of questions that you would need to better understand how to choose your methods for your research project. Now, Sage Research Methods oftentimes has some limitations to who gets access. Usually your university will give you free access if you're on a VPN or if you're on campus. And if you don't have online access in those manners, many times if you go to the library and ask for resources or you ask your advisor, you should be able to get access to Sage Research Methods. Having your methods all thought out can have you more prepared for your prospectus and research plan phase. Now, if you have no idea what a prospectus is or how to think about your research plan, then I would check out this past video that will help you do just that. If you found at least two things useful, hit the thumbs up so YouTube will share this video with others who need it. Your support helps a small YouTuber like me continue to grow. So I want to thank you so much for watching and I will see you next week.